actually never had imagined that I would live in Nebraska. I grew up in California, grew up in San Jose, California, and I just hadn't pictured myself really as living in the Midwest, primarily because my work has an urban influence that I didn't think would really be served by living in the Midwest. However, I became interested in coming here because Steve Barrett um, informed me that the English department had offered me a chancellor's doctoral fellowship, and so I came to pursue a PhD. Well, I suppose my writing has a lot of influences, and it's primarily urban in terms of its directness, I suppose, in terms of its strength. Some people would say in terms of its grittiness, but I suppose I also wouldn't define the urban quality as primarily the only influence because I conceive of myself as, as a romantic modernist poet and that means that there's a kind of a fracturing of consciousness in my poetry that is modernist but there's also an accompanying romantic level of vision in the work and in that sense though my work is gritty I don't think it's necessarily tied to any one state so I think that the landscape in Nebraska has influenced my poetry and my fiction, the openness of the, the spaces, um, the sort of psychological sense of erasure you get from, which sounds, sounds very depressing, but it's actually not. It's very inspiring. But apart from those, those aspects, I think that my work is driven by more philosophical concerns rather than concerns that have to do with, with landscape or with place. An unflinching look at an examination of the taboo truths which define our everyday lives and yet which people are so incredibly hesitant to look at. I don't mean gritty in any kind of an autobiographical sense. I'm not interested in autobiography, in poetry, or in, in fiction. Well, it doesn't play much of a role in fiction, but in poetry it has. And I'm not interested in the autobiographical in poetry because I think that the autobiographical has in some respects resulted in the death of American poetry because autobiographical poets have turned into navel gazers. They turned into poets who are not terribly interested in the craft and intensity which should accompany poetic language and the poetic process. So in terms of grittiness, I'm very interested in taboo breaking. I'm very interested in traveling into psychological territory that hasn't been entered before. But I'm not interested in, in I'm not interested in it in any kind of an autobiographical sense. The writers I've particularly admired really have been the romantic poets. Um, though Keats died at such a tragically young age, I don't think we've really had his equal in any poetic sense since he did die, lo those many years ago. The Keats Keatsian odes, um, Coleridge's work, the modernist poets, um, Eliot is a poet who's fallen a little bit out of fashion. However, you cannot help but admire the grandeur of something like The Wasteland, which is an incredibly powerful poem built up on fragments, and yet those fragments achieve a kind of coherence, a kind of a depth of vision, a kind of a majesty, which I'm not sure really has been equaled in American poetry since then. I do admire some of the confessional poets, not Anne Sexton, um, who's a little bit journalistic, I think, in her techniques. I do admire very much the, the craft of Sylvia Plath, though perhaps not the hyperbole. However, since then, with a few exceptions, I don't find terrifically many po poets that I would admire in terms of those poets acting as a kind of an inspiration for me. I would like to turn to people to writers who are larger than, than myself in some sense and seek inspiration from them. Poetry, which is incredibly enlarged by vision, and yet, in a modernist sense, also engages in a kind of a fracturing of consciousness, because on the aesthetic level, I'm very interested in experimental work. So this wedding of, of experimentalism and vision is primarily what I'm interested in. So I consider myself a kind of a literary traveler. And what I want to do is I want to enter as fully as possible and inhabit other consciousnesses to the extent where I feel that I can partake of that consciousness in a way which will be convincing and enlightening for readers. Welcome to the Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors. 
My name is Vicki Clark and I'm curator here in the Heritage Room. I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. Um, I'd like to also mention that the Heritage Room is a special collection here and it's very special because what it's comprised of is works by Nebraska authors. We have over 3,000 authors represented here with um, over 10,000 volumes that are in our collection. We're very, very excited and thrilled to have such a wonderful rich treasury of Nebraska literary treasures right here in the room. In an effort to promote these authors, the Heritage Room, along with the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association, sponsors this John A. James Reading Series, where we can bring authors to a local audience and then allow the audience to meet the authors as well. And I should also mention that the Heritage Room and its services is supported by an endowment fund, which was especially established through the volunteer efforts of the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association in cooperation with the Lincoln City Library Foundation. And we're very, very grateful for their assistance because without that, we would not be here tonight and bringing you these wonderful programs. So I welcome and encourage all of you to visit our collection during our regular public service hours and so that you can experience this rich treasury that we have. But tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Terry Brown Davidson. I should actually say reader. Uh, she's a native of California, and she's currently a lecturer in creative writing, literature, and composition at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And she also mentors creative writing students there and has also been a reader for the Prairie Schooner. Her collection of poetry entitled Ragman won the Ledge 1994 Annual Poetry Chapbook Competition and was acclaimed with the praise, and I quote, that these poems with the power, uh, these are poems with the power to affect any and all of our emotions at breakneck speed, and with the guiding touch of a genuine craftsman. She's also concerned with advancing the genre of poetry and believes that to do so, one must, quote, return poetry to the realm of imagination, and to view each poem as a new world created from the ground up that's different from all the poems that precede it. And I think definitely we'll be seeing some of that tonight. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Terry Brown Davidson and have her share several of her creations with us. Thank you, Vicki, so much for that wonderful introduction. It's truly a pleasure and a delight to be reading in the Heritage Room tonight. Thanks to, you, to all of you so much for coming. I plan to read both poetry and fiction, and I'm going to start with poetry. Some of these are free verse poems but most are what I like to describe as bastard sonnets. In other words, long-lined, non-iambic pentameter Shakespearean sonnets with end rhymes so subtle maybe only dogs can hear them. The first poem is called Theologies. It was confusing. The Christians worshipped a dead bleeding man slung from four nails. The Hindus revered stones, which they claimed possessed the reverence of all life energy. Nine, I wandered slam, bang, wham into the milkiest, opaquest puddle. It had formed while I was jailed in classes, the rotting rainwater mounting, mounting, until the underpass floated crimson cars, until people strolled everywhere, senseless, stunned, water bleeding down faces, hoisted for mesmerizing downpours. In muck sloshing over my waist, Bevies of pink worms escalated their drowning, spilled out writhing, cast by surging waves that flooded their membranes, smothered their skins breathing. Lost in my shiny gold boots, I thrashed observing their deaths. The dead man rocks, the ugly graying worms becoming split remnants. Nothing good arose from destruction. Yet there seemed beauty in worms, pink-faced as babies before their abrupt demise, in rocks shimmering paler with slick glosses of rain, in the ungodly figure plucking me from deep water. Eiderdown Quilt. I've never understood it, the desire for evasion. A child, I strode imperiously through my universe. I've been told it's a secret of genius, and I believe it. Van Gogh, cowardly in the throes of a wilder epilepsy, might well have fantasized about seizing that severed ear, tossing it into the ocean, sharks consuming the fist-sized ball of flesh with a bloody exhilaration. And if Toulouse Lautrec had wanted to hurl himself downstairs, smash his crippled skeleton to bones, he could have. Art fragments everywhere. Amusing himself with a horror simply more appropriate. Redemption and claustrophobia would artists understand. Not valuing the world's blackened mindset, they delve inward, seek out primary colors, the sexual ceruleans, vermilions of the self. Wrapping myself in an eiderdown quilt, 
I prepare not for sleep, but for hibernation, dipping into my psyche until my canvas rises bleached. At night, loving myself with both hands, it's my energy I celebrate. Raw twistedness, it's epiphany. Blankets. She phoned me and whispered, my mother just died. I tried to feel something. Suffering, empathy, anguish, remorse. My mother was lying on a bed, her head slightly elevated, thin body disappearing under mounds of blankets that couldn't warm her. When I pressed my fingers into the center of her palm, papery veins pulsed watery blood. And to confront the fact of her death was too disturbing, perplexing, wearying. I wanted to stay a child forever. My mama wouldn't let me. I'm sorry, I murmured in mock dark tones to my struggling, weeping friend. She didn't believe me. On my first day of first grade, I was appointed to retrieve the cardboard Dick and Jane from the front of the classroom. How reverently I carried them, Jane in her glossy red dress, gazing up at me with a face that shone pure paper happiness. Dick in his natty navy cardigan, morally excellent, decorous, his face a white spot of scrubbed splendor. Very good, my teacher murmured when I deposited them at her desk. She was 27, massively obese, her fat calves crumpling when she shivered her bulk from building to building. Seven, I believe death and hell were synonymous. And when I heard the second week that she'd passed, I became morbidly concerned with details, imagining the fat, crass body splitting open to maggots before they lowered it into the ground, the mysterious Nebraska earth sprouting shimmering frost in the deadest of winters. You're stupid, he cried. He nearly a baby, but I believed him. Lust cracking open my breastbone, thrusting itself through my pores and thickening threads of heat. And so I trailed my inn, Amarada, into the music building where he slid into the first pew-like row, slapped his book music open on his lap, deliberately dropped a pencil. Fascinated, terrified, I watched the pencil perform its slow motion roll across the classroom, delicately paused by a student chair. Get it, he murmured. Pick it up, you jerk then licked the floor. I gazed straight into his eyes, which shone suddenly opaque. Mesmerized, shuddery, I fell to my hands, knees, on the cold linoleum crawled. Around their calves, around bobby socks sliding sloppily down girls' ankles, around boys' pant legs pressed seam-sharp gray, or more drooping, tired, as if exhausted mothers couldn't iron them. Crawl, he urged, and I did. My knees stickier sore, my back so bowed a saddle could have straddled it, the laugh sliding higher, sibilant or sharper, my vision of maggots dirt, my teacher's coffin accreting so quickly through a landslide of images, her stiff face, stitched closed eyes, the pallor of her skin and chin and mouth bespeaking death, that I understood when I reached the pencil finally, gripped it between trembling fingers, that the loss wasn't my teacher's, her mother's, or even my own, that it crushed all of us in every passing. Books. I tasted them too. The fat azure binding of a tale of two cities satisfyingly waxy, war and peace unsuculent flavored lightly with mold from the trunk of my mother's car. When we moved, the books glowed richer after dark, Tiny, mesmerizing night lamps, we huddled around staring, older since my father's death. The quick succession of cities, alleys, soup kitchens crammed with shoving, sweating strangers, my hands wrapping fists tighter around Mama's knees. But the books were always waiting. Good Christian fun, my mother described them, stuffed dust gathering or wistful into cardboard, obliterating them for hours while we braved that universe of new despair. And when we returned home, the crinkly government check folded in Mama's fingers. The books awaited us, opened, banishing our fears of ignorance. Their plump leather covers, silver cerulean blood-red emerald, adorned our gray peeling dining room like a mixed flower bouquet. And when we woke, before black bitter coffee stirred us to sentience, they did.
This is another bastard sonnet, and it's called Aquarium Dark. It was the jars you needed to see first, the bursting brown brains belonging to Doc Ricketts' lab, the sewagey mess prickled in brine, until huddling in that green aquamarine gloom, we couldn't separate pain from any reptilian ecstasy. Mindful of what we determined to become, a unit devoted to intimacy exploration, we planted ourselves in tired body waves before the giant yellowish kelp beds, those 50-foot weeds detritus shedding, undulating for the duration of several breaths. I don't want to believe love ended that day. If the gathering blackness split by roiling light was any indication, others endure similar turmoil. The human mind, entranced by process, yet shallow in its apprehensions. Beauty, idealism, discovery. Plato plumbed our distaste for verities quintessential as deeper need. We'd rather twist tie the trash, ball up the mess of our lives like stained rags, torch the whole mass until it ignites in a crimson indictment. And yet, in the dark, you kissed me. The Wildness of Marriage, Monterey Oil Light. What you'll remember, what God won't, wipe away casually as the milk glow haloing the waiter's mouth, a baby waiter dipping chicken garlicky in butter and sauce on some impeccable white plate, the whole thrust towards you, so how could you refuse? The shrimp dipped in batter, frying golden, crumbling to shards, muck on your fingers, the sweet grease I study in oil light yellowing your face, eating, devouring, as we swallow and are consumed, Aristotle clearer than endearments we chant by rote, the Nicomachean ethics, how those who rejoice most fiercely in life are most devastated by death. You can't know, love, what I think, feel, remember, pray. Consume more than a glassful of clear gold beer and crumbs suck under my tongue until dissolved. And if we speak of weather, a gold wash of dust shading to purple, Waiting the coastline like a cloud expanding until it lavenders to a stretch of glorious Elysian gray. We taste this inconsequentialness, laugh while the darker half of my mind dissolves, shrugs itself away, though you're here always inside it, as it floats me out beyond the gut-baying sea lions, beyond rocks that can crack bodies to the merest remnant of bone marrow, inside it while blue-black waves roil and I disappear beneath breath pulled aching tender as a baby from pink lungs. And if I drown, it's inevitable. I've rejoiced most fiercely. But Aristotle didn't understand the horror of some relinquishings. In pursuit of self-perfection, in tracking the moral life, the shell of even my ego can crumble between trembling fingers. And Aristotle couldn't understand, perhaps, the beauty of this life design. To eat with you, make love to you, sit with you on a gigantic ocean-swept rock while red gold water drowns a setting sun, slide permeable skin over your five finger bones and pray that whatever causes our deaths won't seek you out for centuries, oh, too alive, too beautiful for an ordinary demise. Okay, now I'm going to read um, a few more biographical poems. A sonnet about Charles Dodgson, also known as Lewis Carroll, author of Alice in Wonderland. A long free verse poem about the painter George O'Keefe. And two sonnets about St. Bernadette Subaru. The Stammer. This is the poem about Lewis Carroll. Torture is to conjure that Dodgson, his sodden face lit by the smeared window he peers through, Alice Little fling gaunt-legged across a lawn set up for croquet. No loopy flamingos there, hedgehogs unfurling in stiff bristled apathy. Just the dark-haired child drawn from imagination more forcefully than from memory. He braces one palm trembling against his desk, photographs whirling through his mind, black and white imprints of desire, tenderness flooding his throat closed rendering the stammer's uprising so omnipotent, it speaks silently of his slackening wants, witnessing her aging. But if the world crowds in to accuse him, 
Only he senses how powerfully some mechanisms grind their rusting gears, tempt him into a cage of mathematical improbabilities, limiting him to glimpses of a dark hair cap shining in riverbank sun splashes, urging his shaking hand to reach for what he needs, then precipitously yank it back, the stammer taking him over more shudderingly than orgasm. The woman who would be O'Keefe. She can't move, scarcely an inch. The only artificial limb, her mind, which freezes here, keeps her leaning against a royal blue armchair, its ragged white star sewn perpetually into fabric her thoughts will never penetrate. A cup of black-skinned cocoa balances in its groove on a sagging padded arm. She sips it as she reads Emerson's Nature again, though the cocoa hours thick remains impervious to her sipping. But if she lacks nourishment, she won't find it in this essay, Emerson's platitudes about Godhead more irritating than replenishing, though age hasn't fossilized her. 81. And the woman is I, a distant speck, projection, tugged towards some future I can only imagine, a battered one-bedroom house, husband dead, cocker spaniels, the black one blonde, buried 20 years ago in the backyard of the shack I shared with my husband then. Even now from this armchair, I can view its ragged glory, the fake red windmill spinning in a sibilant wind, the weeds waist tall winding yellow, yellower over the cocker spaniel's graves, my husband waving from a smeared kitchen window. It's too depressing to contemplate. But in my armchair, I can observe anything, sip my cocoa, flatten Emerson on one knee with the panglorious detachment of a god, Study the gray-bellied attic spider crawling up a chair side as if it amounted to more than a speck, as if I couldn't crush it with a fingernail. And who am I, besides an unfortunate, a porous-boned woman you might pass on a street, hoping not to knock against her, skin her shriveled shins, gaze at pityingly as hunched and humped, she creeps down the gutter, both feet meandering foolishly away from the curb. I'm the woman who would be O'Keefe. When I was 20, I was with her in my mind, that artificial device managing to propel me still. She's limping back from a bone hunt with one red gold chow in tow, a lion of a dog so ferociously huge that when his tongue lolls out, pink as a baby's butt, the surprise splits me quietly as a dandelion dismantling beside the road. All day she tramps through mountains ochre hot, savoring the cracked broken bones spiraling into stains toward some distant singing center, the blacker abandoned marrow. From place to place, the bones silently call, each skull and pelvis individually pitched, so when she nears, the cacophony nearly deafens her. And I'm there, wrapping each drying bone heap tenderly into a moistened towel, preserving the fragments of a story I've never learned, except for the most important part, that genius, according to Schopenhauer, vaults from the will to the world as idea. The perfect glimmering porcelain of a bone's particular power to thrill still cupped on a trembling palm. The woman who would be O'Keefe challenges the world for nothing else. In a house dress faded to red flowers and black cracking rain boots, I trail O'Keefe minus Hamilton back to that house still equipped with its marvelous archway door. The cocoa starts to sour. Emerson's example fades, though not completely. Everything outside the soul is nature, I discover. Standing behind O'Keefe, as with a warped serving spoon, she ladles red beams into, into shallow white bowls, the chow shivering beneath the table, knocking his furred crimson head against the peeling wood underside. I accept my hot bowl, my tarnished silver spoon, sit down beside O'Keefe. Through the smeary, dust-chapped window, sunset, bloody as an egg. I'm 81 years old. My house is wrecked. My body is destroyed. My husband is dead. I lap up the beans on white, white bread, push them in their stickiness deeper inside my mouth. And these next two poems are about Bernadette Subaru, Bernadette of Lourdes, a modern Bernadette. And if her mother was confined to her bed, if her job at a paper factory sank rod into her bones until that striated marrow stank, until shriveling atop a stained mattress, she castigated nights, a broken tiled ceiling, the act of spooning cereal purposeless, 
unprimordial, since she'd glimpsed a lit vision through blackening branches that had made her heart shatter, then whole, leap away like a whitened row. I knew better than to question her pain. Striding that green-yellow enchanted realm, I sought what she sought, suffering having toughened, having toughened me until my bones wouldn't snap, though hers would in a flash, not fragile, but calcified, too beautiful, until I sensed beneath skin how they shimmered like dipped milk, grand as Our Lady, white cowled and hovering in sheets of gray rain as Bernadette's racked face transformed by Christ's pain. The spectacle of Bernadette Subaru in her casket. It's an obscenity, maybe. The way crowds circle her casket, gesticulating, praying, as if that still dead body empathized with pedestrian pain. I know she's a saint. Yet I madden at any small hand threatening to press against glass, deriving its radiance from a spiritual suffering. Even dead, she possesses grace. I know how she died. The vision, searing red lights, the calling out to the Virgin to comfort her when silence, yawning wider, ached to swallow her, fever striking her white cold in waves. Her falling into a hole where black thick mud shoveled atop her bones was the nightmare she woke to daily, her death hovering around some corner nuns passed, stiffly praying. But if death is a sadist, does weariness signal submission? She wasn't a masochist. I want to cry out to all sentient crowds. Wasn't your Christ? Relinquish her, de-elevate her, forget her forever, and let her decay. Rembrandt and Saskia inside my studio. It's true. Stepping across shards of the plaster head I've dropped, I'm pissed off at all the women whose musedness consigned them to nothing. Ayn Rand said it best, paraphrased, let those who would lead, lead, a pox upon the rest. And this morning I feel it, though fragments of the slightest shattering still crackle underfoot, the messes swept up from yesterday, the process of perpetual, I never know where I inhabit it. Unlike Rembrandt's, my paintings shine like starbursts, yellow daisies splash purple raw, roses ghosting their centers, the magnified genitalia, of O'Keeffe's black sheen pulpuses wiped from art's memory by my gargantuan floral clitorises. And though I've antecedents from my vision, there's nothing derivative about my story's tall flowers, entailing the viewer to gaze up so fervently that whatever he's imagined in his lascivious dreams of art are erased by seizures of greatness, blanking memory like a lightning strike. This is the last poem I'm going to read. It's called, I Want to Be a Crow. And if you hear punning echoes of Greta Garbo in the title, that's perfectly correct. I want to be a crow. When the tow-headed boy appeared, knees worn to scraps on tight-fitting blue knickers, I sensed he wasn't real, but something mystical, quietly glorious, a figment worthy of devotion. He approached negotiating the sculpture and collages aisle, Thumb thrust up to the knuckle in his slow breathing mouth. I want to be a crow, he announced when he arrived, stooping to straddle my knees, holy themselves and bony through jeans. I want to be a crow because they're bigger than me almost, and they can fly. I want to eat garbage and crust from white bread and live in a dumpster with a propped and rusty lid and scare people away when I dive at them because my wings are strong as eagles and my eyes, they gleam so black. He paused, withdrawing his thumb with a succulent pop. And when he spoke again, his words shone so clear they glinted eerily translucent. I know what you want, he murmured too brightly. I seized his left hand almost violently, kneaded the fingers like warming sumptuous dough again, 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 until skin slid over bone, afraid to utter in that innocent, mysterious presence what I craved from my white ribs to the inner depths of my skeleton which was this and simply this, to become a woman abruptly for days, then months, then years, to savor the slow rising progression of my hands, hoisting me to a brightness, godlike, transcendent, so I could gaze through the windows my eyes had become, watch near azured sky cloudless spread out and out around me for miles, knowing in that single sensual upthrusting act 
that my mind had joined my body, that both of us were soaring and miraculously intact. I do know that when I'm writing, I have the sensation of inhabiting um, a different consciousness, another consciousness, and that kind of vicarious thrill that's attached to the whole experience is really a, a, a charge that I live for. Some students come into my classes with a sense of having their standards already lowered. They don't really expect much of themselves in terms of writing. They don't really expect to push themselves very hard in terms of writing. And my approach to them is set your standards as high as possible. Aim as high as you possibly can in terms of your personal goals because to me it makes absolutely no sense to aim anywhere else. So usually my students and I get a pretty motivational relationship going because there's, they're, tremendous, they're tremendously gifted students out there. And if I can encourage them on any level, then obviously I want to do that. My students, I think, really have to, to go a kind of a, an immersion process before they can become the kinds of writers that they, they want to become. In other words, I, I do get a lot of students who are aspiring writers, but they don't read a lot. And obviously, this is an incredibly symbiotic relationship that's going on between reading and writing. So I let them know right away that they have to, to read. Just read everything. Read, read terrific literature. Read poorly constructed books, because that can teach them something, too. Read novels, read poetry, read nonfiction, read creative nonfiction. And I think that once my students establish the sense of discipline, everything becomes a lot easier for them. But motivation is always internally generated. And I think that you have to find spurs in your own environment that will, apart from the words of any instructor, that will enable you to achieve your goals. My writing process is pretty much that I like to generate rough drafts without an outline, without a lot of conscious thought that will go into them in the beginning. This gets a little bit tricky when I'm writing a novel because essentially I'm flying blind through about 600 pages. But after you complete that initial rough draft, things get to be a little bit easier. I try not to have any rigid sense of story when I'm writing anything because I find that very inhibiting. So often I'll begin with a phrase, a snatched phrase, an image, a title, rather than something completely thought out uh, through to the end because Writing is such a process of discovery that you're really cheating yourself if you don't allow yourself to, at least in an initial draft, go through this process all the way through to the end. Writing residencies are truly wonderful because they enable writers who don't have a lot of solitude, who don't have a lot of privacy in which to complete work, a little space of time, usually a month, usually two weeks, to pursue their projects in a fair amount of, of solitude um, at writing residencies, the writer's basic needs are pretty much taken care of. They're fed, they're given a writing studio, sometimes a ridiculously large writing studio. Um, you know, their, their, their whole day is structured around the writing process. Most writing residencies, um, such as Yado and the Malay Colony, have an enforced private time where the writer is actually not allowed to speak to anyone during that, that time because the writer is supposed to be intensely engaged in the process of writing. Usually that time is, is 9 to, to 4 in the afternoon. Um, I found writing residencies very inspiring, very productive. However, I think that you have to have a really strong degree of self-discipline to attend them because the possible downside is that um, writers feel locked in their rooms. They feel that they can't talk to anyone else. And, and the solitude drives them crazy. So if you, if, if you want the solitary experience of writing colonies for you, if not, it's probably better to struggle along with your own life. My pursuit of greatness, which sounds so egomaniacal, and it might be on one level, but I don't completely mean it um, in that sense. It's, it's a very individual kind of goal, because I think that American culture has primarily lost touch with a sense of greatness. To recover that, I think you really do have to go back to the, rom the romantics and the emphasis on the individual being somewhat godlike and, of course, a smaller sense of that word. But if you're writing primarily to publish in journals, if you're writing primarily to network with other poets, if you're writing in a therapeutic kind of way to express yourself, and if you don't have an incredibly large sense of what it is that you're trying to do, 
then I don't think that pursuing greatness or even a really high level of achievement is probably a possibility. What I would like to do is I would like to take all of the elements of poetry and romanticism that have been abandoned. I would like to resurrect them. And in a sense, I like to play along the boundaries of old forms, but I like to fracture them in a modernistic sense. And really what I would like to do is something which hasn't been done in American poetry before. I would love to give audience members a vicarious experience that they will never forget and that on a really broad scale could possibly transform their lives. One thing that I've discovered along the way about American culture is that it seems incredibly closed down in some respects. And I would like, through the beauty and the possible power of language, to submerge readers in an experience that is so alien to their being and to their consciousness, and yet is so familiar on some level, that they will follow me on this kind of a literary journal journey that I am laying out for them, and they will be somehow changed in the process. That's a very ambitious goal, but again, why should you aim low? My novel uh, in progress, entitled Marie Marie, Hold on Tight. The title of the novel comes from what is usually termed, what is usually described as the most trivial aspect of Eliot's The Wasteland. And I'll be reading a quote from that um, during the reading. Um, this novel is about um, a young girl who is an extraordinary painter. Her gifts, in some sense, rival Frida Kahlo's. She's just exceptional in every way you can think of. However, her past is dominated by incredible layers of secrets which continue to haunt her. And these secrets have resulted in her current strained relationship with her mother. And there is an infanticide um, in her past. And the roots of this, no one's been able to determine. And so it's a novel which is built on mysteries and secrets. I would like to read an excerpt from my latest novel, entitled Marie Marie, Hold on Tight. The title is taken from the wasteland, and the lines that surround it are often referred to as the most trivial parts of the poem, and I would like to read those lines for you. They are lines from Eliot. Summer surprised us, coming over the Starnberg Gersey with a shower of rain. We stopped in the colonnade and went on in sunlight into the Hofgarten and drank coffee and talked for an hour. Bin gar keine Russen stamm aus Litauen echt Deutsch. And when we were children, staying at the Archduke's, my cousins, he took us out on a sled and I was frightened. He said, Marie, Marie, hold on tight. And down we went. In the mountains there you feel free. I read much of the night and go south in the winter. I was inspired by these lines because I'm interested in seeking the truly extraordinary and dramatic in the scrap heaps of memory. And this probably qualifies since it's considered the most trivial part of the poem. And Marie is a character who really doesn't figure very prominently um, in the wasteland. This novel features a protagonist, Marie Prescott, who is a painting prodigy whose abilities are truly precocious. She may even be another Frida Kahlo. Marie is surrounded by layers of secrets haunting her present and past, including an infanticide no one will claim responsibility for, and Marie's pain-wracked relationship with her mother, which has sprouted from that infanticide, the death of Marie's three-year-old sister, Alyssa Ellen, when Marie was only seven years old. I'd like to read chapter two from the novel, which limbs Marie's relationship with her mother. My silence is inviolable, as is the moon's, a wild burning golden toy, child's ball rolling across white wet terrain when I crackle damply through brambles. I glance down suddenly at shallow wounds crisscrossing my arms. Something in me ripples, surfaces, rounds violently as a mouth towards some gasping of rich shadow, green, green, green. Fumbling, stumbling, I reach up to grab a palmful of moon touch rain-blistered sky before my fingers swing down to grasp, snap, tear a branch. Light skittering everywhere, of deer peeled trunks hunched and warped as sick crones, of fat paddings of underbrush that thrust up clustering when I near the cold running creek, of wood chips crunching beneath my feet, bark that's brown enough, square enough, rough enough, fragile enough, to ignite images of rotten logs, of underlit eyes, blotchy skin, a bruised, blood-spotted mouth. 
images I struggle to douse. Light skittering everywhere as if it were drunk, enjoying its own private riot while I veer away from the creek's saddening call and straggle down the path that leads to my home or to the house where my mother lives. It's quiet tonight on the outside. Just as people's exteriors, interiors rarely correspond, I've learned to distrust the cold serenity of my home, white gleaming as a bubble. The house an A-frame, stalwart, brown trim floating like ribbons around and under eaves. The house white and so very ordinary except for its rigidities, suggesting a subdued opulence that implies money, though we've been dead broke for years and its location, set a half mile back from its more suburban neighbors in this black shadowed thatchet of woods that sings near silent songs of wildness other more discreet houses appear never to hear, then I wouldn't even notice it if I weren't forced to live here, if I weren't so familiar with the concept of irony that my very bones embodied as I creep up the porch toward the door, ease my body inside. She's awake, damn it. Her Chanel number five, the blunt power of my nausea. I never get used to it, never become accustomed to this roiling in my gut. Gliding into the dusky pink kitchen, I listen to the cheering of a sad trapped cricket that's wandered in from outdoors and will remain here until its song deserts it, until it crumbles to shell, then disintegrates to powder. I advance through the kitchen a glitter with wall-mounted pot skillets, green and blue lacquered pans, slick shining knives. At the end of the kitchen, I turn right into the living room where she's sitting in her rocking chair, awaiting me. My mother embodies more perfectly than I can articulate the secrets of this house, its suffering. As if home were a beautiful woman exquisitely dressed, secreting menstruation-stained underwear she hasn't changed in weeks. My mother, the most gorgeous woman I know, the most beautiful I'll ever meet, with clouds of red gold hair floating and shiveringly wonderful auras about her head, with eyes so green they summon to mind sirens, men lashed writhing to mass, under, er under emerald ocean depths filled with white and black striped fish, cool acres of sand rippled by the passing of Poseidon, his echoing horns, with lips so red naturally for my mother dawns never a trace of makeup, that men glance once at that scarlet ripeness and trail my mother from the crackers and cookies I all super savor, longing for her to notice them, though she never ever does, disconsolate as orphans at the checkout line when she pays with her visa or whatever crumpled wad of bills we have on hand, bags her groceries without glancing up, then abruptly leaves. These men study her as if she were da Vinci's impeccably cold virgin of the rocks, yet never dare whimper in her direction, not even when she shoves her rattling cart out through smeary double doors into a splash of hot sun that ravages her sensitive eyes, for reality is the sworn enemy of magic. That's a lesson I absorb with the milk from mother's breasts. She's ready to speak before I round the corner. Where the hell you been, Mar? It's after 11, the school night. I prepared a lie, yet I forget it. Stand there taking in the lines of her body beneath her nightgown, her vibrant hair's wildness. It's your birthday, she says. I remembered. Do you want a present? Mama, I'm tired. I've had an awful night. I study her shadow-draped eyes. I know, I murmur. Do you, Mar? Yes. Do you ever still think about her? All the time, I whisper, something inside me tearing. But not now, all right, Mama? Please, I have school tomorrow. Of course you do. It's just that I can't stop remembering. All night, all night, and I couldn't stop. Would it help if I made you some hot milk? No, not tonight. I wish I could talk to her, tell her that I miss her. I don't think she knows how lonely I get. Oh, I say, a little sadly, savagely, I think she knows, and turned to go to bed. But her eyes moving toward me with the force of dim memory pin me there, back averted, and I know what she's thinking. Wait for her to utter that thought, which would be cruel. Wait for her not to utter it, which would be brutal. And the words come. The words come and lift me up and she tosses me against them as if they were the sharpest rocks splitting my skin as I glance bloody-faced out towards sea. And the waves are tipped black and the waves are tipped red and the waves gleam with the sheer brute power of muteness, the strength of ineffable silence. Mar, Mar, Mar. No, mother, don't. Mar, have you apologized? No, I say, yes, I say, yes. 
It's okay, baby, you know. You didn't mean to do it. I go quiet then because I don't remember it that way. Don't remember that I did it. Remember something worse, far worse, horrible. And the memories assembled in pieces, a jigsaw whose parts shine vibrant, green glowing, shadow splash definite. And I examine it always in parts because the whole is too horrible to contemplate. Because when it's all locked into place, it doesn't resemble what I recall. As though I were assembling a puzzle of Abraham Lincoln and top hat tails that transmogrified into the Eiffel Tower. These things happen, Mama says. God knows why, but they do. I have a headache, I say. Have to go to bed. Stop. Please stop living in the past. Have you apologized, Mar? Yes. Then why don't you ever feel any better? I don't know. I've forgiven you, Mama says, if that helps. Though sometimes when I see that face, that bruised little mouth, it's harder, you understand. Oh, Mama, don't. I stare at her and I know the force, the thread of my pleading is sliding up knife sharp through my eyes and Mama so sober suddenly gazes down at her wildly bitten nails and fingers spread slack across her lap and her mouth bunches and her face freezes so white, stiff, still dead. I used to have fantasies when I was younger that I was Goethe yearning to remove the ice shard from Kay's, Alyssa Ellen's heart, that my mother was the Snow Queen keeping it there. I try a different approach. Did you get out tonight? It works, Mama smiles. Oh yes, baby, I had the wanderlust again. Sleepwalking? No, I just walked. Took my medication. Did it help? I'm not sure. You can get the dosage adjusted, you know. I'm not even sure why I'm on it. I'm certain I'm not depressed. Tell me about your walk. Ma, it was wonderful. The belt was all lit up, and I saw a giraffe, and the moon was a big golden harvester tonight. Huge, enormous, bright, shiny as a penny. Mama, it wasn't. I saw it. It was a half moon. Are you calling me a liar? Something dangerous is starting. I'm saying, saying that you're mistaken in your mind. Like Dan was mistaken in his mind. Don't you ever bring up Dan again, I snap. But my threat's hollow. Mama glares. Hastily, I avert my eyes. She retains all the power. And Dan will always be with us, pacing our living room in his tight-fitting jeans, rubbing one palm over the sickly stubble he never stops struggling to coax into a beard slamming into the chair or sofa wall because he's drunk or because he feels like it. You never did like, Dan. Tell me what there was to like. Everything. Don't you think you're exaggerating? He was a wonderful lover. Oh, that's an appropriate thing to tell your daughter. He loved me unconditionally, as none of you have. You, your father, Alyssa Ellen. Mother, Alyssa Ellen was three when she... I pause. When she... what? Nothing. Maybe you'd better make me that hot milk now. I'd better go to bed. I leave her rocking in the oak heirloom chair, surging forward back, staring down at her ragged cuticles, messy half moons, and is wrapped to concentration as she's managed for days. In the bedroom, I close my door, lean shivering against the battered wood, my palms pressed flat behind me over the grainy, splintered surface, though I'm simply too tiny to keep holding the door closed with my weight, hands. Still, it's comforting to sway here intact, as if my physicality could be a bulwark against nightmares swirling up, ghost pallid, trembling, manifold, manipulative, though it's only the moon shedding its thick, irreverent whiteness over the length of my body, my eyes blanking with afterglow, a light that nearly makes me shudder in its intensity. This visceral reaction, what will render me an artist someday, as Dells reassured me again, again, again. This ravening appetite for the sensual thingness of things, the props of my interior planet, the imagination I cultivate strenuously as the imagination strip hoists five-pound dumbbells and stride, stride, stride on a treadmill belt, luring them nowhere to tone what they have, which is less than what I own, love, which is more, more. This is what I possess. This bauble of a moon, savoring its slimness, halved golden shouts. This bedroom, the palish pearl color, the tender meat of a clam, though the walls are filthy in blotches and patches, though the walls are written on in pen, mother, and crayon, me. And what do these words, cluttered walls, proclaim? Damn you, mother, ars gratia artis, me. Someday I'm going to kill myself, me. Go ahead, just joking, mother. And then I remember the books, 
Dell's books. An offering for a Nefertiti, for a Velasquez, not for ugly, runtish me. My sallow skin, blue-black hair, wide-spaced hazel eyes, triumphant drabness rendering me an ant in a universe, obliterating me to a speck of the smallness of my smallness. And then I realize those intensely negative thoughts are poisoning me again, resolved to do better, though better is difficult when terror strangles me blind those nights I wake, sweat-soaked, to the delicate fingers wrapping my throat, tightening to an ecstasy of breathlessness, of release. And then I remember the wood chips in the forest and the way they made me feel loud, too loud, crunching underfoot. And when I summon the slightness of my courage, steady my breathing, open my eyes, my bed staring back with the dull glazed eyes of the drowned, and I resolve suddenly to crayon it, just so, in moths, in olive drab, Crayon my bedspread with its Winnie the Poohs chasing honey pots, though both the bear and the pots he's pursuing are these flat, sordid colors because they've been layered to a dim crustiness beneath several years of dirt. Mother doesn't believe in washing, at least in cleaning anything connected to me. And the part of me that Dell's urge to fight back has been sued every day to a dwindling whisper buried inside my body, so distant I'll never find it. But the painting's everything, isn't it? The painting's what might someday save me, though even hope is a mirage sometimes, or a platitude. I close my eyes tight. Red-black floaters drift against my lids. I'm dreaming of the books, and Rembrandt surge through my mind as a series of spotlighted, ghostly faces, and Stieglitz's photographs of O'Keefe with those elongated fingers posed punning with balls, and the torso shots of O'Keefe perfectly headless with her long breasts dangling, and the lush black bush sprouting the luxuriance of an impenetrable forest. And suddenly I can't breathe, race to my closet, sort through piles of raggedy school clothes stuffed to the bottom, tug out my drawing pad and box of warm blunt crayoles and crouch in the corner, my knees facing the bed, my black hair dangling in strings I tug over my face as I scrutinize the paper's blankness, which my mind converts instantly into a forest, into an assemblage of ocean-swept rocks with a dwarfed human figure strolling stiff-limbed in avoidance around them, into a clump of bedraggled trees with leaves ripped off one by one by one in an incessant nattering wind. The possibilities are what I relish adore, because it's impossible to select one image when I have all this emotion still seething inside. I select the crayon, Hunter Green. Sketch a green, rough-textured stump. Imagine moss swallowing it, layering it in plusher blankets. The stump grows more gnarled with each pressing down upon paper. The moss thickens, deepens, burgeons. I imagine as is the stump's pubic hair. Remember them a Greek portrait called Rape, with ridiculously overgrown genitalia painted in as a substitute for a woman's stopped-up screaming mouth. And again, I'm ripped between twin impulses. Laugh and let Dell inside me kill myself and let Mama dispose of the body. Of course, I choose neither. Indecisiveness rules richer worlds. Rapidly, I select a mauve crayon from my tattered yellow box, sketching smearily a stopped-up cry for a horizon, a sky so drably rose it swelters with claustrophobia, with a chronos mad desire to swallow me bloodlessly whole. I'm outlining a clenched lip mouth on the side of the stump, when the music of her footsteps strikes, though that music's always inside my mind, a tintinite is born of perpetual dread and a brute, brute hunger that pries me open more violently than a speculum. Mar, Mar, you ready for bed? Yes, I manage. Stuff hastily my drawing under the bedspread. You're not lying, are you? No, I mutter and swallow. Of course, there's no lock on the door, and there hasn't been since Alyssa Ellen or Dan, because I know Mother wants to keep me in her sights as if I were the peregrine falcon bent on straying from the bag she slides over my head and the tether she attaches to one clawed, curling foot. Let me kiss you good night. No, Mom, I don't need to, really. I'm fine. May I come in? I'd rather you didn't. You're not lying, are you? Of course not. Then let me see you. Why? I want to see if you're ready for bed. Mama, I'm a grown woman. You could take my word for some things. Are you sure? Sure? Her voice grows husky, deep, dark as smoke. Remember Alyssa Ellen, she murmurs hypnotically as a mantra, her face, her voice half audible through the door, and I shiver. 
she comes in then. She comes in because she's my mother and I'm her daughter and she's entitled. Enters with that incredibly stagey glance I've come over the last two years to loathe. Before she was more honest, blunt in her requests, needs, desires. But time has muted her strangely. Opaqued her with the skin of subterfuge, trickery, manipulation. So when I gaze at her sometimes, I see only the gauze, the thick tissue wrapped around the woman I used to know when Alyssa Ellen knew her too. And after the change, I still spotted shimmerings, rich but translucent as a blast of blue sky after days of an, of an obscuring rain. But then the shimmers went away quietly as Alyssa Ellen's fists reaching up to tug Mama's hair into her mouth. So you lied, Mama says, swaying with the odd posture of a woman with a back problem, though she's perfectly healthy. Her nipples lift the whisper of high in front of her nightgown. You haven't even changed. No, Mama. Well then, why? It was just less complicated. You can't sleep in your clothes, baby. You'll get them all wrinkled, soiled, as if my clothes are ever cleaned, as if my clothes are ever pressed. I'm exhausted, so I thought I'd just sleep like this, okay, for tonight. No, baby. Please? No. Why not? Because it might become a habit, a habit born of laziness. And then you'd always want to sleep that way, night after night after night. And then you'd get so you'd never want to change your clothes at all. I wouldn't, Mama. I promise. It's all right, sweetie. I know you're tired. I'll make it easy for you this time, OK? I'll help you take them off, and I'll help you put your nightgown on, and then you can sleep straight through till morning. No, Mother. Please, I promise. I'll do it only this one time. Mother's face grows sad then, so sad I want to reach out, cup that exquisiteness in the cradle my thumb and index fingers might form, stroke the lavish satin of her skin until her anxiety flush fades as she's the virgin of the rocks once more, white, impenetrable, splendid. Don't you love me anymore, Mar? Oh, Mama, of course I love you. Then let me help you. I close my eyes then, because it's inevitable, and I let her undress me. That's it. Thank you very much.